Well, if you have your Bibles or a gadget that you're affectionately addicted to, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, and I want to address some very, very difficult issues in our world today and be a blessing not only to you, but I believe your families and your friends and acquaintances that you have throughout your, your day and your, your life. And the subject that I want to tackle, I have dealt with in the past, but I want to hit it from some different angles during this time together. And that's the subject of marriage, the subject of marriage. And unfortunately, the home has been under assault for many decades. The recent assault on the institution of marriage wasn't necessarily a surprise to me. It was a tremendous disappointment in my heart that our country is this backslidden at this time and the primary leadership throughout the country is void of a knowledge of God and, and His Word. But what has disappointed me is the confusion in God's people. In God's people. And marriage is an institution ordained and created by God Almighty and it is the second most important decision you'll make in this life second only to your relationship with Jesus. And so not only do we need to know something about marriage and this institution created by God, we need to be preparing our children for the marriage altar. And your children and your grandchildren are going to face a lot of confusion as they're being brought up. And we need to know God's word in this area and be able to share lovingly with again our family and friends concerning marriage. Look at something that the Apostle Peter said here about marriage. In verses 1 through 6, he speaks to wives and how a wife is to conduct herself in reaching her husband, in ministering to her husband. And I don't want to read those verses for a host of reasons. <laughs> but I do want to look at verse 7 where he deals with the husbands. And a profound statement that the Word of God makes and I'm going to start with the King James Version again of verse 7. Look at this. It says, Likewise ye husbands. He's dealt with the wives about what Bible submission is all about. And that's one of the reasons I don't want to touch on it. Is because it takes at least an hour, usually two hours, to really explain to people what submission in the Bible means. And specifically about a wife submitting to her own husband, even as unto the Lord. I grew up in circles where wives were abused and the subject of submission was used to abuse women. And specifically, again, submission within marriage. And this is not a, a word that we've heard in the sense of a bad word or a bad thing. And it's a good thing to learn how to submit to authority, how to submit to God's word, how to submit to church leadership, how to submit to, to police officers. I need an amen on that. Amen. Let me just encourage you, young people, you get pulled over, submit. If you're abused, we have authorities in place, and the church will even be here to defend you and to, and to make a stand against any kind of corruption within the police department or abuse of anybody. But you don't try to take a cop's gun, can I get a witness? Amen. And you don't rebel and resist authorities. You learn how to submit and then work things out and walk things out. Well, he's dealing with that. And then again, now he deals with the husbands. He says, likewise, ye husbands dwell with them. Those are the wives according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Think about that. That your prayers be not hindered. The Amplified Bible says that we need an intelligent recognition of the marriage relation. An intelligent recognition of the marriage relation that our prayers would not be cut off or hindered. So how I relate to Sue in marriage and how I understand the institution of marriage affects my spiritual life. Affects my prayers. We can't see our counties touched and changed. We can't see the fires of revival, if our prayers are being hindered. So it's important that within marriage, we have an intelligent recognition of a husband. That's a boy, if you don't know that. That's a boy. We need an intelligent recognition of a wife. That's a girl. That's a female. Y'all can nod your head and act spiritual on this at any moment. 
That's what a marriage is. It's a boy and a girl. It's a male and a female. It's no longer two, but now those two become one flesh in the covenant of marriage. And in that covenant, we are supposed to honor each other. We're supposed to respect each other as heirs together of the grace of life that our prayers be not hindered. There should be no abuse in the institution of marriage between a husband and a wife. There should be honor between a husband and a wife. I need to honor Sue, not abuse her. I need to honor Sue, not manipulate her. I need to honor Sue. Even in discussions, I have learned as the head of my home and as the provider of the home, as the husband in the relationship, that I always do have the last word in any discussion we have. It's usually yes, ma'am. But I do get the last word, hallelujah. Well, when it comes again to the very institution of marriage, I don't know if you've thought about this, but marriage has been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And we are the first generation in the history of the human race to even question what a marriage is. That's how under assault our culture is right now. That's how demonic our culture is influenced that the very institution of marriage at this point is not only under assault, but under great perversion, great perversion. And there's a reason for that. The home, marriage, husband and wives, family. It's not only the oldest institution created by God known to man, it is the backbone of our church. It is the backbone of our community. It is the backbone of every civilized society is husbands, wives, dads, moms, and raising children in that kind of environment where dad loves mom, mom submits to dad, dad and mom submit one to another, dad and mom honor one another and live under the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That is profound. And you and I are having to deal with issues now and answer questions and have to deal with issues that was unknown for thousands of years. And so we need to know what God's word says about marriage and about the purpose of marriage. And I shared some of this at our Jubilee in our leaders conference. And uh, the response has been very, very positive and and overwhelming. There's a point, saints, where we as a church need to understand that we're here for a purpose and it isn't to have a bless me club. We are here to be salt in this earth. We are here to be light, the light of the world. There has to be at some point loving pushback. I'm not talking about riots. I'm not talking about burning businesses down. I'm not talking about violence like the world operates in when they don't get their way. I'm talking about loving pushback, loving. And the key word is loving, loving pushback to darkness, loving pushback to evil. There's a point where if we don't push back against darkness, how far do you think darkness is going to go in these last days? How bad do you think things can get? I promise you, your wildest imagination has not dreamed up what the devil has in store for man without God. For, for a society that has lost their moral compass. If the church is not the conscience of our culture, who is the conscience of our culture? And so there's a point where we have to say no to abortion, no to cutting baby parts up and selling them, no to barbaric, ungodly, immoral acts. Thank you, because I cringe every time I feel this in my heart to even say something about abortion, because I would never want to harm or condemn a woman that has had an abortion. And many women, thank God, are stepping up today to the plate and are speaking out of the mistake they made and how that they wish someone would have encouraged them not to do that, would have taught them where life begins, would have taught them the sanctity of life and would have spared them not only the loss of their child, but the pain of abortion and the fallout of abortion that you don't hear nothing, nothing about. And yet we sit around and talk about Nazi Germany and how could the Jews be slaughtered like that and the gypsies be slaughtered like that. 
there weren't just 12 million Jews. There was almost 12 million other people killed who tried to defend the Jews. The gypsies were slaughtered under, under that madman's regime. The handicapped were slaughtered. Gays were slaughtered. I could go on and go on with the madness. And I used to sit around and wonder, how could the church be silent? So silent during those times. Where was the opposition? Where was the company of people with a moral compass that just said, wait a second, we're not going to stand back and let you slaughter these people. And yet we stand back and have slaughtered over 40 million babies. And when I bring it up at large, people get offended. People get mad. And I mean no heart hardship on anyone that's been through something like that. But I'm actually going to put together a teaching on the issue of the sanctity of human life. And we're going to do it through the live feed so I can just get it over with and everybody hear it at the same time and have the car running and get out of Dodge. Amen. <laughs> but the thing I hate about it is usually I bring it up like I'm doing now in passing and I'm not able to talk about God's love for someone that's been through something like that. How God's not condemning you. On and on I can go. So I am going to minister on some of those things. But marriage is the same thing. We have no idea what just happened at large. And how five people, five people with a perverted sense of morality have imposed something over 360 million people. This country was not created to be under the tyranny of five people in black robes. That's not America. That's not who we are. This is not only unconstitutional what happened and violates the Constitution. It's very immoral what's happened. And most of us, I've, I've been wanting to say this, and I'm so glad for this opportunity to be at my favorite location. <laughs> most of us really are born again. Most of us really are filled with the Holy Spirit. And listen to me carefully. We really are kind people. We really are merciful people. We really are compassionate. I'm going to deal with same-sex attraction for the four or five that come back. Okay, those, nobody, uh, the four or five is over here. I'm going to deal with all these other issues of weaknesses in our flesh and our sexuality and how that God has addressed these issues very clearly for all of us, not just someone struggling with same-sex attraction. I have a lot of mercy for people with same-sex attraction. I have a lot of mercy for people with pedophilia attraction. Can you imagine really being turned on by an infant? That's pretty, that's pretty sick. But what about somebody that really has those feelings? What about somebody that's attracted to an animal? I can't imagine being attracted to an animal and being aroused sexually. Over an animal? But what about somebody that would be struggling? You think I would be condemning? You think I would be mean-spirited to them? You think I would just beat them up? No, my heart would be broke for them. And I would want to help them. And I would want to help them deal with their flesh. And deal with that issue in their life so they can be prosperous now and functional. And not mess their heads up and their lives up with that kind of weakness in their flesh. I ask you to pray for me. I have opposite sex attraction. <laughs> I, I struggle sometimes with opposite sex attraction. And I know nowadays I'm evidently in a minority. <laughs> but I mean, if I yielded to my flesh, I could get in trouble. Anybody else honest, honest enough to admit that you have a flesh that's no good? And that if you don't learn how to reckon yourself dead, that you can do a piece of stupid? And somebody says, well, I just don't appreciate the church just dealing with gay and lesbian issues. And, and they speak out against that and not necessarily all these other things that I just mentioned. Well, I've not had anybody commit adultery in the history of my ministry that now pickets my church and insist that I condone it, that I embrace it, and that I celebrate it. And bathe the White House in some colors now to show my support for people having affairs. If you've had an affair, God loves you. I love you. We need to work that out. But don't you dare ask me to condone it. Don't you ask me to embrace it. And don't you ask me to stand up here and celebrate it. I've never had anybody molest a child. 
that has come to me and say, Pastor, this is my orientation. And if you don't embrace this, I'm going to shut your church down. You see the difference? There is a difference. And if you think you're going to skirt this issue, if you think you're going to be able to just be silent and ignore it, you are grossly deceived. This kind of perversion will be imposed upon our children and our school systems. It's going to affect this transgender type mindset in which we can't have boy bathrooms, girl bathrooms anymore. I don't want my, my daughter in a boy's bathroom. Amen or oh me. If you think you're going to be able to run your business now and, and not be under the assault of litigation because you believe marriage is between a man and a woman, you're grossly deceived. We are seeing an evolution in the world, especially with ISIS today, in which if you love Jesus, if you love God's word, if you stand for anything moral and decent and of value, you will be persecuted, but now it's morphing into prosecuted, and in some cases, executed. There are Christians being executed around the world, saints, for their faith. It's happening. It's happened in America this month, where you either take a bullet in the head if you say Jesus is Lord, or maybe one in the knee if you don't serve Jesus. We are seeing evil abound. We're seeing darkness increase. And yes, we are kind people. We're compassionate people. We're merciful people. And nothing would make me happier than to be silent on all of these issues we are facing. But I can remember when I was literally persecuted by church people saying that, and things like, well, pastor, we can't legislate morality you know, what a dumb thing to say. Uh-oh. Everybody say, I love. Brother Dwayne. Now, that's a good thing to say. But a dumb thing to say is, well, pastor, we can't legislate morality. Let me tell you something. All legislation that is godly legislates morality. And if we don't legislate certain morality, we'll see a day where all the legislation is immorality. Well, we can't impose our morals on other people. They're imposing their immorals on us. Now, if you mean we can't legislate changing people's hearts, you're 100% right. We can't pass enough laws that are moral laws to change a person's heart. Only the gospel can do that. Only God can do that. Only the power of God can change our hearts. But to say things that we have said over the years is profound to me in the sense of we have a moral responsibility to vote our conscience. We have a moral responsibility to elect people that are going to be more lined up with God's word than the word of the devil, than the word of the devil. So let's talk about, again, marriage here and where we get our answers to what is a marriage. Because, well, that person says this is a marriage now. Now, people don't know where do we go to define a marriage. What is a marriage? Well, I'm going to keep going to Jesus. Go to Mark chapter 10. And Jesus gave a response to a question on marriage that we need to tell people. Because your children are going to be asked, what is a marriage? Is a marriage between two men? Is a marriage between two women? Is a marriage between a mom and a son? It's coming. That's how asleep we are. We have no idea what just happened. Because if two men can be married, if two women can be married, why can't a mom marry her son? Why can't a dad marry his daughter? Who are you to say? Who are to you to say a dad can't marry his daughter? They love. Who are you to say a brother and a sister can't marry? <gasps> and if a brother and a sister marries, love wins. No, family dies. If a mom can marry a son, love doesn't win. Maternal love dies. The love a mother has for a son has a line. And the line is sexuality. And the minute the mom has sex with the son, you just killed motherly love. Love didn't win. 
When a dad touches a daughter inappropriately, love does not win. Fatherhood dies. Bottom line, we're so confused, we don't even know what love is. We don't even know what love is. It is not love when a mom sleeps with her son. It is not love when a brother and sister sleep together. It's not love if two brothers sleep together. It's not love if two sisters sleep together. No matter what a Supreme Court says, no matter what a president says, no matter what a backslidden church buys into in these days of deception, that is not love. Jesus is love. Jesus is love with eyeballs, hallelujah. And so if you want to look at love, look at Jesus. And so they were asked, Jesus was asked by the, the Pharisees about divorce and remarriage. And his answer is in Mark chapter 10, and I'll start in verse 3. And he answered and said unto them, what did Moses command you? They asked him about a bill of divorcement. Can we divorce our wives? Can we break this covenant? And he said, well, what did Moses tell you? And verse 4 says, And they said, Moses suffered us or allowed us to write a bill of divorcement to put her away. And Jesus said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote this precept. In other words, for us to divorce, we have to harden our hearts. And that's why if you don't know Jesus, and you enter this thing called marriage, which is a battlefield, a war zone, you, you wind up through hurting each other and not honoring each other, and respecting each other, you wind up hurting each other and hardening the heart. And then you can get a, a divorce. That's why in pastoring, I've tried to teach our pastors that when people are having marital problems, a lot of times they'll quit church. Why do they quit church? Because see, church is a place where your heart keeps soft. Church is a place that if you keep listening to me and, and other leaders in the church, it'll keep your heart soft. And your conscience pure. And so it's hard then to put one another away. You're able to, with a soft heart, deal with some issues. Overcome these issues. Get some change in your life and in your marriage. So Jesus said, it's because you, you, you had hard hearts. But look at what Jesus did now. Verse 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. God's the one that makes you male and female. God made you male, and God made you female. I had to minister to a, a gentleman a couple of weeks ago, godly man, godly family, and one of his sons is really struggling now, and because of darkness increasing, and because of Hollywood celebrating perversions, they always have, but they're really dancing in the streets now with all kinds of perversions, this boy is being assaulted in his mind. And he literally wakes up and goes to his dad and says, Dad, I'm confused today. I don't know if I'm a man or a woman. Today I feel like a woman. And so the dad, you know, rightfully so, is concerned. And if you hang around me, I just don't get concerned about anything. None of this stuff is new. Amen or oh me. And he's panicking. And what, what do I tell him? Tell him he's confused. Tell him and ask him, what does a man feel like anyway? He won't be able to answer you. And then ask him, what's a woman feel like? Ask a woman what a woman feels like. They can't tell you. <laughs> this is demonic. Amen or oh me. If I woke up tomorrow feeling like a woman, A, I would say, God, I wish it was possible I could rule the world. B, it ain't going to happen. doesn't matter how I feel. What if I wake up tomorrow and I don't feel married anymore? Am I not married? What if I wake up tomorrow and I don't feel? I don't feel. We live in such a feely world. How do you feel? Feelings. <laughs> Everybody dominated by feelings. All sin is rooted in feelings. You can't name one sin that doesn't have an emotion attached to it. That's how come you get deceived and you wind up in sin is your emotions. Can I get a witness? Sin is not smart. It's not smart. Have you ever, you ever sinned? Nod your head on this one. Act spiritual. Have you, ever, have you ever gotten through it and went, what was I thinking? 
Like I said this morning, you weren't thinking, you were feeling. And you were led by your feelings. You were led by your emotions. All sin, James chapter 1, says all sin comes out of the lust of your flesh. And once that lust is conceived, once that thing is finished, acted upon, then it leads to sin. It leads to sin. We have to learn how to be controlled by our spirit, man, by the word of God and the spirit of God, instead of our emotions. You just wake, what, what do y'all do when you wake up in the morning and you don't feel like you love your spouse anymore? Well, hopefully you've been taught love's not a feeling and get over it. Okay, you haven't been taught that. I need to teach you that, I guess. You need to teach them that. Okay. Well, I don't love you anymore. What does that mean? What does that mean, I don't love you anymore? Well, it means I don't feel ooey gooey and, and, and a flush rush of emotions anymore. Did you think that stuff was going to be there every day? I mean, there's been times I've kissed Sue and fireworks went off. Thank you, Jesus. And there's other times I've kissed Sue and it's like, hmm. That was dead. That was a dud. There weren't any, any sparks on the fuse. Come on. Am I the only one that's woke up before and spent a half a day with one of my kids and questioned that lovemaking night? Was it worth it? I don't remember it being that good. Do I not love my kids now because I don't have this feeling? Are y'all getting this? I mean, there's been times, especially my girls, I've been talking to my, I've been for, I've been waterboarded by my girls. I mean, they would be arrested for crimes under the Geneva Convention for what they've put me through. Four hours. And I'm having to reckon dead a lot of feelings and they ain't good ones. My eye twitching. Does that mean I don't love my kids anymore? No. It means I love them very, very much. Amen. And so as the culture embraces death, as the culture embraces corruption, as the culture embraces perversion, feelings by demonic powers are going to be heightened more and more and more. And we better learn how to walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Jesus said, from the beginning of creation, God, creator God, from the beginning of creation, Creator God, Creator is over creation, and creation submits to Creator. From the beginning of the creation, God, that's the Creator, made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father, it's a male, and mother, that's a female, and cleave to his wife, that's a that's a female. And they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain or two, but one flesh. What therefore God, creator, hath joined together, male and female, let no man put asunder. He's not just talking about your marriage, though it applies. He's talking about Creator God created marriage, and Creator God creation marriage said marriage is male and female, and male and female become one in the covenant of marriage, and let no man, let no president, let no Supreme Court put asunder what God has joined together. Amen. That's powerful. And yet, how many Christians are confused on what a marriage is? And yet Jesus went back to the beginning. So if Jesus, our Lord, 
went back to the beginning to answer questions on marriage, that's where we need to go to answer all of the questions we're being asked about about marriage today and what a marriage is and how a marriage is to operate and how marriages function and again what are the purposes or purpose of marriage years ago these are, there's things in my mind that have just been branded inside of my brain and they'll be there on my deathbed and, and this is one of the things I'll never forget I felt like God was telling me to minister on the purpose of marriage and I'd never heard anybody minister on the purpose of marriage. And so I'm thinking, is this just my mind? And why am I thinking this way? And everybody knows the purpose of marriage. I thought it would be an insult to minister to people on what a marriage is. <laughs> I've, I've discovered it wasn't an insult, that's for sure. There's five people on the Supreme Court that I guarantee you never went to Sunday school. Can I get a witness? They don't know evidently what a marriage is. And evidently God's people don't because we're confused. So what I did was I thought, well, I'll take a survey. I'll just go. And at that time we were probably running about 800 people. And so I'll just go to a few people and take a quick survey. Why did you get married? So I asked people, Jimmy, why'd you get married? And the response blew me away. They looked right at me and went, I don't know. Why did I get married? So I panicked and went, no, no, I'm not trying to get you to question your marriage and wonder why'd you do this? They didn't even know the question. And so I said, no, I want, I want you to tell me the purpose. Why did you get married? I was shocked at the answers. These are godly people. These are people raising kids that you got to get your kids to the marriage altar. Some of you are raising your grandkids. And you got to get your grandkids to the marriage altar. And if you don't even know the purpose, how are you going to prepare them? Amen. Amen. And so I was shocked. And I just want to go through the top four answers I got on the purpose of marriage. And before I look at the purpose according to the Word of God, then I, I want to look at what it's not. Because nobody could tell me what the purpose was. And all of the answers were wrong that they gave me. All of them. Not one person. This is my church. <laughs> These are the best saints on the planet. And not one person could give me a biblical answer or define what's the purpose of marriage. If you don't know the purpose of a thing, you are destined to abuse it, misuse it, and frustrate the original purpose. Everything has a purpose. You have a purpose. One of the series I've got coming up that I can't wait for is how to discover and fulfill your purpose. Because every one of you have a purpose. And if you don't know your purpose, the world, your family, and your friends will abuse you, misuse you, and frustrate God's original purpose in your life. Everything has a purpose. Look at these beautiful, these beautiful instruments. This instrument has a purpose. And it's a specific purpose. There was a creator that made this a creation. And the creation doesn't know its purpose. Only the creator knows that purpose. That was a different creator. A different creation. And it has a different purpose. But you got to know the purpose to fulfill it. If we had some construction going on around here, and, and I grabbed this beautiful, 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 just wow, this thing's pretty. <laughs> and took a 16-penny nail and drove it into a two-before. How many of you know I'm abusing the purpose of this, this, this bass guitar? But I could do it, bless God. I could get her done. But I would abuse the purpose. And now guess what? I just frustrated the original purpose. Not to mention the owner's attitude of this precious gift. <laughs> Amen? We would have to be working on somebody's attitude. We have live feed that you're very familiar with. And you, you understand how it works. And there takes some type of dish to make that work. What if we wanted a victory life in the Philippines? 
and I sent a satellite dish over there so we could have a live feed. And then I visit the Philippines because it's not working. And when I get there, my satellite dish is being used as a walk. <laughs> you, could, you could cook out of a satellite dish. Can I get a witness? That's an abuse. That's a misuse. And now you frustrated the original purpose. Am I making sense? Everything's that way. Marriage is that way. If you don't know the purpose, you are destined to abuse it. And people abuse marriage all the time. Godly people abuse marriage. Now the world is totally abusing marriage because they don't know the purpose. All right. The number one. I'm sorry. I get tickled every time I think of this. Why'd you get married? Number one answer. To be happy. Go to Six Flags, dude. <laughs> Do not get married to be happy. Take a cruise quick. Do not get married to be happy. Do you know how many people get married to be happy? And that's why you're miserable. That's why you frustrate your spouse. I love Sue dearly. I'd give my life for her, no doubt about it. But she can't make me happy. I can't look to her to make me happy. She's not the source of my happiness. I could give you scripture after scripture after scripture that talks about how God is the source of our happiness. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there's no vision, the people perish. But happy is the man that keeps God's law. Do you know where happiness comes from? Faith, obedience to God's word. Job said, happy is the man God corrects. Now I know why many of you aren't happy. You won't let God correct you. Because it's in God correcting us, chasing us, that ultimately we're happy. We're happy. Psalms 127 says that children are the heritage of the Lord. They're a blessing from God. And it says, happy is the man that has his quiver full. A quiver in the Bible holds the arrows, and traditionally it, it was five. You're not even happy till you have five kids. <laughs> so you thought the two were making you unhappy. No, you need three more to be happy. <laughs> happy is a man that has his quiver full. Some of you just have one kid and you quiver. Happiness comes from God. Happiness comes from serving God. Happiness comes, listen, from fulfilling my purpose. Happiness comes from finding my station in life and loving God and loving people. Happiness doesn't come from people, places, or things. It comes from God. Yet how many people get married to be happy? You better teach your kids, get happy in God. Find someone else happy in God. Get married and celebrate your happiness with God. No man can make you happy, ladies. We're primarily the source of most of your grief in this life. How deceived can you be to get married? Thinking a guy will make you happy. Most of you, welcome to the mission field. Because a guy ain't worth a plug nickel till he gets a good woman at large. I say that from personal experience. Amen. So make me happy, make me happy. No, you don't get married to be happy. Number two, to find value and worth. Can you imagine somebody looking at me and I say, why'd you get married? To find my value and my worth. I can't find my value and worth in Sue. Your value and worth only comes from God, the creator, because you're a part of his creation. The way you know you have value and you have worth is not by a person and marriage, but by a revelation of the cross and the price God paid to redeem you back to him. That's why I treat every one of you with such high regard and respect is because I know what you cost God. Don't tell me you don't have value. Don't tell me you don't have worth. You were not purchased by gold or silver, but you were bought and paid for by the precious blood of the Lamb of God. Wow. How much value do you have to God? I don't know how much value is Jesus to God because he gave Jesus for you. He traded Jesus, made him a ransom for you to buy you back. 
Don't ever let anybody tell you you don't have value. And don't look to people to find your value. Your value comes from the cross. Your value comes from the price, the amount God paid for your life. Now, here's my favorite one, and I need to be careful here because I've said some things trying to help people. But we need to be careful here. Why'd you get married? I had to find somebody to complete me. Well, I love you, but you're a complete idiot. I say that with respect and love. But how many of us think like that? I'm incomplete. How many single people do I have to deal with all the time? They feel incomplete, and somehow they think when they get married, that will complete them. And Paul wasn't married, and he was complete. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and, and 10 says that in Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. You can't find a man, ladies, to complete you. Guys, you can't find a, find a woman to complete you. No, you need to learn how complete you are in Jesus and comfortable with that. Find somebody else that's complete in Jesus and comfortable with that. And the two of you become one flesh and now be a powerhouse in the kingdom of God because you're already complete. There is a synergy in marriage. There is a power in marriage, but it isn't to complete me. Sue doesn't complete me. I don't complete Sue. We are complete in him, which is the head of all principality. And again, we celebrate our completeness together now in a new, a new vision as no longer two, but one. And then the last one that we're experiencing in our culture, marriage is not a social experiment. It's not a toy. It's not like something in a lab and in a test tube that we can experiment with. No, it is something specific that God gave man and that God protects. Now, I want you to, if you're taking notes, write this down or, or try to remember it. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, God says, Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers I will judge. That's in the New Testament. In other words, God protects marriage. In other words, not all this sexual perversion make up a marriage. He separated sexual perversion from the institution of marriage. And that there is sexual love within marriage that's sanctified. But outside of marriage, everything else is some type or form of perversion that's very deadly and dangerous that we'll look at. So what is the purpose of marriage? Let's go through this quickly. Why marriage? What is the purpose of marriage? Number one, number one, procreate. Procreate. Have children. Now, I know man thinks he's smarter than God, and I know man thinks he's the sum total of all knowledge, and that the Bible is, is pre-dinosauric and archaic, and that God, bless his heart, he just doesn't understand the times. There are people that think like that in our culture. But I'm telling you, God ordained marriage, male, female, father, mother, for an environment to raise functional children. Functional children. Do you realize under the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 6 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And in doing so, you need to honor your father and your mother that things may go well for you and you may live long on the earth. He said it's the first commandment for children with promise. In the Ten Commandments, I think it's number five. I need to check that out, make sure I'm right about that. I think it's number five in the Ten Commandments. And that used to confuse me. The New Testament said it's the first commandment for, with promise. Children, obey your parents. Parents. Now, I'm not condemning anybody that's a single parent. You've got a hard road to hoe. A row that God never ordained for you to have to hoe. And yet in a fallen world, there's a lot of single parents. And so I don't, I don't put them down. I celebrate and commend them for the challenge they have. Because that's not God's best for you. And it's not God's best for your kids. Can God make up for it in grace for you? Absolutely. Can God make up for it in grace for your kids? Absolutely. But in the name of grace and in the name of the power of God for making up for our shortcomings, we need to shoot for God's best that kids need a dad. They need a dad. 
And there's something about a dad that God knew that we don't know that a kid needs that affects his well-being and her well-being and them living long. Can you imagine the damage we're doing to children taking away a dad and a mom? And how we are making it impossible them, for them to fulfill the first commandment in life with this perverted culture we're living in. I know people don't think about that and they don't think like that, but God does. In Malachi chapter 2, verse 14, I believe it is, 14 and 15, God says, why did he make them one? Why did he make male and female one in the covenant of marriage? It says that he might bring forth a godly seed. God loves kids. And God loves his kids having kids. Did you get that? Well, I had a late, bless, bless our hearts. Well, I just don't think we should bring a kid into this world. The world is so dark. The world is so bad. Well, the world is dark and the world's bad, but it's been darker. It's been badder. <laughs> Things have been worse in the world than they are now. I want you to think for a minute. I know the young people think history starts just with them being born. There's been thousands of years of tyranny. There's been thousands of years. ISIS used to be the norm throughout the world for thousands of years. The world is a dark place. The world is a bad, fallen place. And God wants us to bring kids into this world believing they're a part of the answer, not the problem. Your kids are the answer. Your kids are the ones that will be trained. Your kids are the ones that will know God. Your kids are the ones. Yeah, will some of our kids go awry? Absolutely. But the majority of our kids are the salvation of the next generation. And we have to renew our minds and realize God loves kids. And I'm not condemning anybody who doesn't want to have one. It is your choice. But think about this. God's never created a kid independent of man. Do you know God? It, the only thing God's not created is a baby independent of man. He created the trees. He created the birds. He created all the animals. He created a man, Adam. He created a woman, Eve. But he's never created a baby independent of us. This is a very special relationship we have with God in covenant with him and in covenant security. I bind myself to you in covenantal love, not because I feel something all the time, not because it's the Walt Disney world of the spirit that you and I entered and we're going to ride the Peter Pan ride for the rest of our lives. No, we've been on Space Mountain before. <laughs> But because we are bringing forth a godly seed. And our godly seed is bringing forth now a godly seed. Amen. We don't even think generationally. Even in marriage, man, you hit a rough spot and you don't think legacy. You don't think, gen do you know it takes generations to build wealth? Now we do live in a unique time when the tech world is exploded where there are some millionaires that were made overnight but that that in the history of man is rare wealth takes generations to build and to pass on and each generation build on it and many times we don't even realize in giving up on our marriages we're giving up on generations and i'm not condemning anybody i'm trying to cast a vision of marriage what's the purpose of marriage genesis chapter one be fruitful and multiply replenish the earth Again, somebody says, well, the earth has enough people in it. Not godly. And God's looking for the godly seed. Malachi chapter, chapter 2. So that's number one is family. We are so twisted in our mind. Our politicians in Hollywood is now trying to redefine family. And you're, you're just laughed at. You're scorned if you, if you say Family. And family is a, a dad. And family is a mom. And family is kids. That's so pre-dinosauric. That's so Pollyanna. No, it's so B-I-B-L-E. Hallelujah. That's what that is. That's what that is. So that's, that's number one. Number two, number two is to avoid, not cure, but avoid fornication. 
1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 and 2 and verse 9. Let's read it quickly and then I'll come back. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Got to explain that one. Nevertheless, verse 2, nevertheless to avoid fornication, to avoid fornication, to avoid sexual perversion, to avoid your sexuality out of control because we're sexual beings. God created us all sexual beings. Come on, don't be too nervous about this. You make me nervous. We're, we're sexual beings. Just pretend you understand me. We're created sexual beings. And there's situations where God has said to avoid now fornication, sex outside of marriage, nevertheless to avoid fornication, let every man, that's a, that's a male, man, have his own wife, that, that's a girl, that's a female, and let every woman, that's a female, have her own husband, that's a male. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto her husband. I don't even want to touch that right now. Go to verse 9. But if they, he's talking about now widows or, 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 or widowers, if they cannot contain, go back to verse 8. And I say, therefore, to the unmarried, anybody, well, don't raise your hand. We have unmarried here. And widows, that's people who were married and you killed your spouse. <laughs> Come on, I had to lighten it up. You just got tense on me again. I could just feel my, around my neck. The widows, it is good for them to abide even as I. What does that mean? Single. There's advantages to being single. But then he says, though, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. It's better to marry than to burn. Now, I am impressed. I think I forced you into that. Amen. But I am impressed. Because I remember teaching this 15, 18 years ago, and I didn't get one amen, I didn't get one nod. We believe in our culture, it's better to burn, it's better to fornicate, it's better to live in all kinds of sexual perversion than to marry the wrong person. And I'd rather my kids make some mistakes fornicating than to have to go through a bad marriage. That's how we think. That's how we've gotten deluded and polluted by the world. God says it's better to marry than to burn. If you can't control your sexuality, if you, if you burn, you need to get married. It's better for our kids to marry early than to fornicate for years and marry late. And yet, most Christians don't even think that way. The world certainly doesn't think that way. This is foolishness that I'm preaching. Go back to verse, verse 1. Now, concerning thing, the things wherein two I... You wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, I've had to teach parents in raising their children well, what's acceptable and unacceptable in dating. According to that scripture. And of course, it took me two weeks to have to teach the difference between dating and mating. <laughs> we'll just leave that one alone. The word touch there means to inflame passion within. To inflame passion within. There's exceptions to every rule, but primarily the male has the driving sex drive. And you don't, you don't have to do much to inflame passion within a guy. <laughs> primarily the girl, though, is, takes a little time. Just multiply by ten what you're feeling. And wait till God calls you to preach. <laughs> I mean, guys, we're just different. Guys and girls are different no matter what. The culture keeps trying to cram down our throat. Men and women are different. And again, there's exceptions to every rule. And I'll explain that when I talk about creation and male and female and how there's overtones and crossovers of male and female in all of us. And again, men are stimulated different than women are stimulated. I was asked one time, well, what really stimulates a man? And I, I don't know how to answer that. Wind? <laughs> Radio signals? I don't know. 
But our boys have to be taught, you never create passion in the woman. Because if you create passion in the woman, it's all over but the shouting. Amen. <laughs> all right, let's go to the next one. I just. All right, number two. Or number three. That was number two. And we'll skip number two. Number three. Again, become one flesh. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. The man and the woman were naked and not ashamed. And they became one flesh. They became one, listen to me, and this is just a mystery. And why Christians don't know these things, I don't understand. They became one in diversity. They weren't one in sameness. You can't be one in sameness. Their unity was because of diversity. And when we become one in our diversity... When we become one in our differences, that's when there's a synergy that takes place and life is created. See, the one flesh principle of a man and a woman in marriage becoming one flesh, it's not just sex. It involves sex. But there's more to it than just sex. In that unity, life is created. And what we're supposed to see is that in marriage and in us becoming one flesh, which involves, yes, our sexuality, but it involves much more than our sexuality, life is being created all around us. When Sue and I are one spiritually, life is being created. When Sue and I are one solically, getting on the same page, getting in agreement, life is created. And then, of course, we understand if we're one physically, life is created. And so within marriage, there's a companionship that's unique. There is a friendship that's unique. There is a partnership that is unique. And man, when it is done right, one of the most precious things on earth is marriage. And one of the things that saddens me is there's been so much divorce over the past half a century. And so much pain that young people today do not have a positive mindset about marriage. They literally avoid marriage because of the pain they saw with their, their parents at large. Because of the things said about marriage. Because of the lack of positive things. When's the last time you heard a preacher really stand up and celebrate marriage like I'm celebrating it right now? I bet you some of you have never heard a preacher celebrate the beauty of marriage. Talk about marriage as a positive thing, a powerful thing, a beautiful thing, a godly thing, a fun thing. I just married, I guess I'm running out of time, and I, man, I went all over the place. I don't know if you tracked with me tonight, but I just married uh, a friend of ours, member of our church in Durant, their kids, that I've practically raised both of those kids. They've been in the church since they were babies. We're going through the ceremony. They knelt down. I asked them, would you kneel down for my blessing? I speak a blessing over everybody I marry, the blessing that's in my life. And so I knelt down with them at the altar and uh, I started talking to them just from my heart. And they started bawling. I started bawling. And it was the most awesome private experience that I recall in years in the sense of I'm trying to explain to them at the marriage altar. Look, life is too short not to have fun. Life is too short to carry a grudge with your spouse. There's going to be a lot of people you're going to struggle with. But don't struggle with your spouse. Forgive each other every day. Let go of stuff every day. Don't let one day go by that you let anything get in your heart. And just like Jesus forgives us, and there's mercy. Forgive each other. And whatever you do, have fun. I'm fixing to pronounce you husband and wife. And after that, you get after it. <laughs> Amen. Have fun. You know, you can't even say those things at church. That it's almost like I'm, I'm treading where angels dare to tread. <laughs> to say we're supposed to enjoy each other. And I'm not talking about just sex, mostly sex. But I'm not talking about just sex. <laughs> I'm trying to lighten my heart on this. I'm not talking about sex and just sex. I'm talking about fun. Sue and I have been married 35. 
34. It'll be 35 next month, and I know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. I'm, I got my act together here tonight. 35 years next month, and we have fun every day. There's not a day we don't make fun of all of you. It's, it's why I'm still sane as a pastor. Amen. That we, we have fun. And you know, if young people could be brought up, and every time we mention marriage, it's a positive thing. Every time we mention marriage, it's a good thing. Every time we mention marriage, it's fun. It's an adventure. How much could be resolved if we just knew what the purpose of marriage was and enjoyed this godly gift from God? Amen. Man, I hope you got something. I apologize. I covered everything on the planet, I think. And I'm glad you came. And I hope you come back. Because I'm going to share some things about marriage. I'm going to share some things again about our flesh and how to deal with our flesh. Because some of you are going to have to deal with your kids over some weaknesses. You're going to have to deal with family members that are, that are confused now in their gender. I mean, there's some sad things you're having to deal with. And I want to try to present some practical answers and God's, God's power in our lives to, to live healthy lives. Amen. Father, thank you for these precious people. For additional free CDs or a catalog of all our teaching messages, please contact Dwayne Sheriff Ministries, Post Office Box 427, Durant, Oklahoma 74701, or call us at 580-920-1791. May the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace.